So um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce um, Dr. John Dobley in a, in his, for his second um, seminar in the Storr uh, Life Sciences Lecture Series. Now, for those of you who weren't at the seminar yesterday, I'll repeat a brief introduction, abbreviated form, but also just to tell you a little bit about, uh, briefly, John gave a seminar yesterday, uh, probably more broadly focused than the one he'll talk about today, where he sort of went from some of the um, initial musings of Darwin and asked whether or not um, they were uh, right in light of using uh, crop systems as models for evolution uh, in a general sense. It was a really excellent seminar. So if you didn't attend it, uh, well, that's your loss, but it was very good. So um, anyway, it's my pleasure to introduce John again. Um, very briefly, uh, John had, uh, has sort of a uh, dichotomous aspect to his uh, educational background. I won't tell you where he was at because it's not so relevant, but John started his undergraduate degree in the biological sciences and sometime along the line decided he really wanted to be an anthropologist. So he did that and through both a bachelor's and master's degree he obtained a degree in anthropology. Um, and this is important, I think, because I suspect that it motivated his interest in domestication, which, of course, has a lot to do with, with human activities, well, entirely to do with human activities. He went to his uh, Ph.D. at Madison and this time started as an anthropology major, I believe, uh, and then decided he wanted to switch back to biology and joined a program at the uh, Department of Botany where he obtained his degree and I think did a lot of the initial prospecting for species that would later become the focus of his work during a postdoc, in fact, two consecutive postdocs at North Carolina State University where he made um, in uh, Major Goodman's lab uh, what I suspect was sort of a seminal set of observations that basically said there is a one uh, amongst the many relatives of domesticated maize that genetically is very similar but phenotypically very distinct. John has spent the, the remainder of his career uh, to date, at least in large part, exploring the uh, genetic and molecular bases of these phenotypic differences. How can small um, uh, genotypic changes lead to large uh, phenotypic consequences? And while the, the seminar yesterday was more general, I think that today John is probably going to follow up with some more detailed stories about the molecular basis of the domestication pathway in maize. And I'll stop there and let John pick up. Once again, I'm working off of two microphones. Uh, so I have to take one second to get this hooked up. And yeah, I prefer to use the microphone because I have a relatively soft voice, and so it's easier for me this way. Um, I'd just like to say I'm having a great time on my visit and um, really uh, interesting and stimulating and fun talks with everyone today and yesterday, and so it's just been uh, great for me, and I'm learning, I'm learning a lot more than you guys are learning, I think, so uh, I feel like I'm the principal benefactor of this trip, so. Um, I, you know, also make sort of a one observation is, you know, I'm going to talk today about our attempts to understand um, the, the molecular and biochemical basis of some of the changes that took place during maize domestication. And it's something that I, I'm always uh, humbled by is hearing the Arabidopsis people talking, talking to them today. It's just how much more is known in Arabidopsis. And, you know, we're just sort of working, you know, in a very primitive system by comparison. And so it's really... Um, uh, humbling for me, and and you'll see that we, even though I feel like we're learning some stuff, it's nothing compared to what can be done in Arabidopsis uh, for what we're trying to do with maize and teosinte. I, I wanted to, all, you know, just at the beginning, a little bit clipped off, um, just tell you the people in my lab over the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years have done most of the work that I'm going to talk about today. So I acknowledge them up front, and I, I don't need to introduce all their names. Uh, a few I'll mention, like Tina Nussbaum is my uh, current technician, who's just really, really good in the lab and has done a, a great deal of uh, the work. And uh, Y. Wang is uh, a really brilliant molecular biologist. He currently is at Monsanto, and he's done a lot of that uh, work, too. And, and Richard Clark was a, a postdoc who just has uh, a, you know, a great uh, talent for experimental design and, and uh, getting things done, and so he did a lot of the important work. And, and then Tony Studer is a current um, grad student who's uh, going to get some even more detailed answers about this. So anyway, these are the people. And I'm sort of just the uh, fundraiser and spokesperson for this group. And so I think that they get the credit if there's credit to do. I'll take the blame if there's any blame. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, 
You know, I titled this Unraveling a Developmental Pathway Involved in Maze Domestication. It's really not what, really the way I thought about this when we started it, but uh, it's kind of the punchline I'll get to in the end and that uh, uh, one thing we stumbled upon we weren't really anticipating. So this is uh, um, kind of an outline of what I want to do today. Just to keep it a little bit light in general, I'm going to start off just making some comments about the origin and the history of maize. Nothing too heavy. Um, there was a controversy surrounding the domestication of maize, and I'll mention that briefly. Um, it's uh, kind of, I don't go too much detail there. Uh, the early work on trying to understand the genetic changes, and just at the genetic level, what changed genetically to convert the wild ancestor of maize, called teosinte, into domesticated maize. Um, and uh, some, our current research, which is really focused on the molecular biology of the domestication process, yes. As it, as it happened in maize. And then um, some final thoughts, which I haven't got yet, so I'm hoping they'll come to me during the next, uh, the next 50 minutes. So here's um, a teosynthesis, wild ancestor of maize, and, and here's a, a modern maize inbred. And it's pretty typical of modern maize. You know, it just has a single stalk, has one, sometimes they have two ears. There are types of maize that have a few basal stalks as well. But teosinte is a highly branched plant like that. And um, it has ears, but the ears are very small, and they're in the axles of the leaves along these branches. It has a central stalk. You really can't tell it um, from the, all the side stalks and all the branches, but there is in there one central stalk, which is just a little bit larger than all the laterals and basal stalks. So teosinte is uh, distributed in Mexico and uh, South America. It's, northernmost points in Chihuahua, and it's kind of you know, an odd distribution through the northern parts of Mexico. It's most common in this southern region of Mexico here, and then it, there's versions of it in Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. So this map's a little bit outdated. So, and in Honduras, there's a population in Honduras, and then um, even in Nicaragua, a little further to the south, there's a, a, a type of teosinte. Um, and so it has a fairly broad distribution. Uh, they've been given different taxonomic names, and I was, that was my uh, graduate research, was uh, doing the taxonomy of these things. We used to go out and collect plants and then um, you know, put them into the herb herbarium, and I'd tell my kids I spent my youth gluing dead plants to cardboard, uh, which doesn't sound very exciting, I guess, but uh, that's what I did. Uh, here is me at that time in my life. Uh, <clears throat> uh, not a very spiffy dresser, I guess, back then. Um, holding, a, capturing, I should say, a teosinte plant. And it's a big plant. It's a wild grass, but it's a huge plant. Uh, you know, this one is, I'm six feet tall, so this is, you know, getting up there to nearly 12 feet tall. And they, you can even see bigger ones. You know, they probably get up to 15 feet tall. This is a more spindly one. But um, here, this particular one, and this is actually more typical of what teosinte looks like in Mexico. It doesn't have very many basal branches. But even up here, it has these long side branches. And this long side branch has a tassel on the tip. Here's the main stalk. It has a tassel. But each of the long side branches has a tassel on the tip, where in corn, there would be an ear. But then the ears of teosinte are in the axles of the leaves along those branches. And that's just a patch of teosinte growing along a stream in Mexico. Um, so this is a teosinte population in Mexico. Uh, Jeff uh, Rossi Barra here is working, uh, he and his postdoc are working on analyzing some population genetic data from that. But it just covers hillsides like that. And this could go on for miles. Like when we were up on top of this hill, you would just look all over and just hill after hill after hill covered with this, uh, these teosinte populations. So it would be a tremendous resource for collecting because each of those is producing, hundred, each plant is producing hundreds of grains and teosinte is, of all the grasses in Mexico, it has the largest grain. All the annual grasses, there's some perennials that have larger grains, but of all the annual grasses in Mexico, it has a, a large grain. And it actually has a very large grain for any, most grasses. So it's, it would have been a tremendous resource if they could figure out how to harvest it and process the grains. So one of the, one of the things we had worked on uh, was just answering the question, is, t is teosinte the ancestor of maize? And we did this by sort of standard phylogenetic analysis in which we have samples of all different kinds of maize from all over the Americas. They're all shown here. So up in the Andes and then South America, Guatemala and so forth, all the way down southwestern United States, Mexico, Arizona. 
and like the northeastern United States, even including Canada. And this basically represents the entire range of where uh, maize was grown in the pre-Columbian period. And the, the Native American peoples adapted that in languages, but they all trace back to one point. So all that diversity traces back to one point. And if you go around the base of the tree, what's there is teosinte. And there's a particular type of teosinte, which I show here, with these little um, asterisks that are which maize was adapted. And here, these represent all those ranges but they all trace back to one point. So all that diversity traces back to one point, and if you go around the base of the tree, what's there is teosinte, and there's a particular type of teosinte, which I show here, with these little um, asterisks that are is closest to modern maize. And so this is, we think, the type of teosinte that was ancestral to modern maize, and that it all took place in circulations that are less like maize, and so uh, this is the region that we think was probably the uh, cradle of maize domestication. Can't be careful, you can't really say it was the, the cradle of maize domestication because you know, 10,000 years ago, the distribution of these populations could have been different. So we're, we're making an inference based on the assumption that the modern distribution of teosinte populations is similar to the uh, uh, distribution of teosinte populations. Can't be careful, you can't really say it was the the cradle of maize domestication, because you know, 10,000 years ago, the distribution of these populations could have been different. So we're, we're making an inference based on the assumption that the modern distribution of teosinte populations is similar to the uh, uh, distribution of teosinte populations 10,000 years ago. Uh, this is just a uh, kind of a travel log shot. This is the Balsas River. And this is just with some of what it looks like. It's very similar to that previous ladder showed where the hill was covered with um, uh, teosinte. And, you know, if you went over this hill, you might find exactly that. You might find other hills covered with the teosinte. So um, a lot of archaeological work has been done. Of course, the record's not nearly as complete as we'd like, but this is uh, uh, from one site called Tehuacan in Mexico, where the oldest archaeological ears are found. They're about 6,000 years ago. So that's the earliest evidence. And this is already corn. It doesn't look like corn there because, of course, it's highly degraded, but uh, a botanist studying it under a microscope can tell for sure that this is an uh, ancient corn cob. It's only about two centimeters long. It's tiny. It's like the tip of your finger. There's no modern corn that small. And then through this, the years at that single site, you can see a gradual increase in the size. So it was a very long process of gradual increase in the size of the, of the maize year. And a teosinte year itself would be even longer than uh, two centimeters. Maybe it'd be more like about five centimeters long. So in the early process, there may have been some compaction of the year uh, to make it more compact. And then later on, a proliferation of the number of kernel producing units so that it got longer and longer by adding additional kernels. Um, the archeological record, this comes from a book uh, on the origins of agriculture shows that, you know, just what we'd expect to see. The oldest archaeological corn cobs are the 6,000 uh, uh, years before present right here. There's some other type of evidence uh, that comes from uh, phytoliths, little plant stones that the corn can produce. And those are a bit older, and they also come from that same area about 8,700 years ago. And that fits, we actually did a molecular dating of the divergence between corn and teosinte. We came out with something like 9,600 years ago doing a molecular dating. So all the evidence then we have from the molecular and the archaeological data would say that domestication took place here in southern Mexico, you know, somewhere around 9,000 years ago. And you can see it gradually spreads out. So then as you go head northern Mexico, the oldest is 43,000 years ago, 32,000 years ago in the southwest, and by uh, 2,500 years ago, it's into eastern North America. And similarly, 3,200 getting into northern South America, and then down into the Andes, their oldest is uh, 15,000 years ago. So it's a, it's a really nice story of origin here, and then diversifying out into the other parts of the Americas. As a consequence of that, most of the genetic diversity in maize is kind of uh, associated with, uh, <clears throat> or genetic patterning of diversity is associated with uh, how far apart things are from one another. So there's a nice correlation between, if you take two types of maize, how genetically related they are is very highly correlated with how geographically close they are. So if you take corn from Canada and corn from uh, 
uh, chili, you know, native varieties from those two regions are going to be genetically very different. They're very far apart. But if you take corn from two villages that are nearby each other in Mexico, then they'll be uh, very genetically similar, and that's what you can see here. And of all the different types of parameters you might think explain genetic relationship in, uh, with, uh, uh, in, among maize varieties, the greatest uh, explanatory factor is ge geographic distance. So maize spread out, diversified in all these environments, and has kind of remained isolated. There hasn't been a lot of movement of maize from different regions uh, comp you know, by uh, uh, trading between groups. Show you a little bit of that diversity. Uh, this is a little bit bleached out. This is corn in um, Guatemala. It can reach about 22 feet in height. That's Hugh Iltis, who is about my height, six feet tall. Um, and he's uh, standing next to a plant. I wish we could darken the this, this lights a bit, just so you can uh, see this. It's, uh, to me, it's quite uh, remarkable. It's not the best slide, but you know, you're, you're down there for just a, a, a few weeks, so you don't have time to always get the best slides. <laughs> Um, so here he is. This is feet. Here's he standing here. He's six feet tall. He's holding onto this stalk. There's the ear on that stalk. And so it's, he's six feet. So that ear is like maybe 12 or 14 feet off the ground. And then he, you follow it all the way up. There's another, I don't know, 10 feet or something up to the tassel. Okay, so this is a tropical environment. What does a plant want to do in a tropical environment? It wants to grow fast because it's got a lot of competitors, right? So it wants to keep its place in the sun and not get shaded out. And so the corn here has been selected for that sort of thing. It has very strong stalks. In some areas, they actually use them for fence posts and for building their homes. And this is kind of the uh, other end of the extreme. This is corn in the, um, uh, on Hopi Indian uh, uh, Reservation in Arizona. It's adapted to the desert. It's very short. You can see, I don't know how this is. A, a, I think it's G.N. Collins, who was a famous uh, agricultural geneticist at the turn of the century. It's in a publication by him. And uh, so it's very short. It's adapted to the desert. It's, they plant them very far apart because each plant needs enough moisture, right? You can't get too much if it's, it's competing with its uh, other ones. So they plant them far apart. The thing I find really cool about it is they plant the seeds 12 inches into the ground. And then they have a hypocotyl that can elongate through that entire, or mesocotyl, whatever it is, uh, can elongate that whole 12 inches and then get the plant up. So they can get it down and plant it where there's a lot of moisture to begin with. So, you know, you can see why people who work on corn really like it. It's just got all this diversity and remarkable uh, story. And then here's just a picture of some of that diversity. But what's remarkable is that those are ears from a single corn crib in Mexico. This is not like we walk, you know, went to get uh, one ear from all the different types of corn around the world. This is how you go into a single farmer's bin. Okay. Now, if you took every ear of corn in Iowa and looked for all the diversity, of course, they'd all look identical, right, because they're <laughs> all the same hybrid. But uh, in Mexico, it's a different story. And, and, if, and if we got um, uh, different types of corn from all over its native range at different land races, right, it's, it would even be much more impressive than this. So there's a tremendous amount of diversity um, in corn, you know. So you know, it's a nice story up to here, but there was a problem. And that is the problem is that corn and teosinte don't look anything like each other. In fact, uh, yeah, I mentioned this yesterday, is that when teosinte was first discovered, they didn't even think it was related to corn. They thought it was like over in the rice tribe of grasses. And then later on they said, no, you know, it's a little bit like a foxtail. So they stuck it into the tribe of grasses with foxtail. And then later they said, no, no, it really does belong in the group with maize, but a kind of a distant relative of maize. And then they said, well, you know, probably it should be in a genus next to the maize genus, so the genus Euclina. And then they said, well, no, really should, probably should be right in the same genus as, as corn. So we'll put it in the genus Zia, but we'll name it a separate species. And then Ueltis, my advisor, said, no, this is the same species. They're just two different funny-looking versions of the same thing. So they reduced finally to two different subspecies of the same biological species. And a person who played a big role in uh, getting all of that recognized that teosinte was the ancestor of corn and that is genetically the biological, biologically the same species as George Beetle, uh, known best for the one gene, uh, one, en one gene, one enzyme hypothesis, Nobel laureate, uh, a really distinguished career president of the University of Chicago, uh, the director of biology at Caltech, um, and, uh, but as a graduate student at Cornell University, he worked on teosinte. 
And one of the things he did is he made crosses between teosinte and corn. And he was surprised to see, wow, the hybrids are fully fertile. They are completely fertile. And not only are they completely fertile, but their meiosis is fully normal. They have all you know, nicely paired chromosomes. And they don't have like odd chromosomes you know, that don't assort properly, as you would expect in a wide cross, to things that are unrelated. And so he published back then, along with his advisor, that biologically these two things are the same species. And, um, and so he said, well, how do you get corn from Teosinte, then, or from Teosinte? And he proposed that as few as five gene changes could be sufficient to convert Teosinte into a useful food crop. Now, he was battling against the predominant view at the time that corn was domesticated from a different wild corn that went extinct and no one has ever seen. And Teosinte really wasn't uh, a part of the picture. So there's another hypothesis uh, which was promoted by a professor at Harvard University. It was wrong. It took a very long time to get it out of the literature. It's still not entirely out. Uh, but um, Beetle was the person who uh, made sense of the whole story and, and also went out and convinced a lot of people by presenting the data that would show that Teosinte uh, was the ancestor of corn and that uh, and, and Beetle's view, a, f a small number of gene changes could do the trick. And his evidence for a small number of gene changes was uh, simple Mendelian genetics. Cross corn and Teosinte, get an F2 population. If it's one gene, then a fourth of the progeny should look like corn, and a fourth should look like Teosinte. If it's two genes, a sixteenth should look like corn, a sixteenth like Teosinte. Well, he came up with numbers that suggested it would be about five genes. And so he, he used on that logic, said five gene changes. And he, he knew it was complicated. It wouldn't be simple. But he said five gene changes would you know, make Teosinte into a useful food plant or a primitive type of corn. And then here it is again. So here's Teosinte. Here's corn. Uh, there, a modern corn. And there's the F1 hybrid. Okay, you can see it has all the seeds that fold. They're, they're, they're little white bits. They're filling out. They're going to be make fully fertile F2 plants. Uh, that was self. And, um, and so we need to go from here to here. And that's kind of what I'm going to mostly talk about today. And what are, the, what are some of the gene changes to make that transition? It's really a remarkable change, in part because here the kernels are not visible. They're inside these little casings. And here this is an immature teosinte ear. So you're looking at a casing on the outside. And here, there's no casing. The kernels are naked on the outside. And the bits that make up the casing form the cob of maize. The way I like to put it is that uh, this involved turning the, the teosinte ear inside out. You had to take the kernels, which are on the inside, and put them on the outside, and take all this stuff that's on the outside and, and put it on the inside to make the cob. So, so we did QTL mapping to try to figure out if we could uh, uh, make some statement about the inheritance of the differences between maize and teosinte. And this is kind of a very general uh, summary of the results of two different QTL mapping experiments. These are the 10 chromosomes of maize. And then we measured nine traits that kind of distinguished, that made, measured the principal differences between maize and teosinte. And these gray shaded areas to show what percentage of the difference in, uh, summed over all those nine traits is explained by a particular region of the genome. What you can see, here's a region that explains a lot, here's a region that explains a lot, and here, and here, here, and here. So you can say one, two, three, four, five, six. And so if you want to say, Beetle said five, you could say six. So you might say, well, this one doesn't really count, so maybe it's only five. You know, where do you draw the line? But you know, I always like to think these six are really large, and then you know, these other chromosomes have relatively modest effects by comparison. So we became interested in those major QTL peaks. We don't know at this point, is that a cluster of a dozen or hundreds of genes under that QTL peak, or is it just one gene? Um, but we became interested in trying to uh, pick those apart. And what we found was that, and I'm going to talk about these genes today, is that under this peak is a gene called teosinte branch. And essentially, it explains everything under that peak. This very big, tall peak is the effect of one gene. There may be some other small factors there, but we've done a very careful uh, test of whether we can find it. We can only find one other very tiny factor gene there. And then here, too, is a very large effect gene um, that is, you know, essentially explains this peak. And we <clears throat> now are working on this peak here, and we think we've, this will be very easy for us to get to. And this is a harder peak, we think, but we're working on that, too. Okay, so here's a, a, I'm going to talk about one of the first peaks. Um, 
<coughs> take a maize and teosinte cross. Here are some of the F2 plants. You get some F2s look just like maize, some look just like teosinte, long branches with tassels on the tip, and some are intermediate. Um, if you map the QTL, we find multiple QTL. If you measure branch length, or you, I point out that the, in maize, that what's at the tip of the branch is an ear, and teosinte, what's at the tip of the branch is a tassel. So it's the change in sex of that terminal inflorescence. So if you measure the sex of the, of the terminal inflorescence on the lateral branches, you can map QTL for that too. And here are just some of the QTL. And we've always found a very large effect QTL for these traits on the long arm of chromosome 1. And so we took that long arm of chromosome 1, and we took that bit of chromosome, and we just, by back breeding, put the maize version into teosinte. And here's what happens. Here's a typical teosinte plant. This is actually a sib of that plant and a grown in the same growth chamber, but it is homozygous for the maize ver that maize chromosome segment. And it has branches. They're just very short, and each one has a little teosinte ear on the tip instead of a big maize ear. So that one chromosomal region explains the change from that morphology to that morphology. Okay. Now, you know, I can't say it's one gene from this, but I can say it's at least one chromosomal region. So what was uh, a nice... Uh, 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 happy event for us was that if you looked at where we mapped our QTL, there was a known mutant in maize right there. I like to say prophetically named teosinte branched. So this was just a, a, a spontaneous mutant that occurred in maize that makes maize look like teosinte. Uh, the, the professor who found it, his name is Charles Burnham at the University of Minnesota, he called it teosinte branched. So that became our candidate. So here's teosinte, here's uh, cultivated maize, and that's 100% pure cultivated maize just with that one gene knocked out. It's the teosinte branched mutant. It essentially gives you the same plant architecture as teosinte with the axillary buds sort of de-repressed so they grow out to make these long branches, lots of basal branches. In teosinte, you have a tassel at the tip of the branch. In maize, you have an ear at the tip of the branch. And in a TB1 mutant, just like teosinte, you have a tassel at the tip of the branch. So it not only changes plant architecture, it changes the sex of the inflorescence on the tip. The only thing it doesn't do, it doesn't make an ear. It's, it's a purely male plant, and so it's incapable of making an ear. So what we think that gene is doing for teosinte, it's in, important in forming an ear in addition to controlling plant architecture. So we cloned that gene, um, and it's TB1. It turns out it started a, a new family of transcriptional regulators called TCP transcriptional regulators. The T is for teosinte branched, and they are, contain a basic helix DNA binding domain. <clears throat> and what we think it does, based on the loss of function or, or null mutant phenotype, is we think it's, a fun its function is to be, developmental function is a repressor of organ growth. So where the, when the gene is expressed, it's repressing the outgrowth of the lateral organs, the lateral branches, and so you, uh, you get short branches as in maize, uh, when the gene is knocked out, you de-repress the lateral branches and you get these very long branches. There was um, one of the other members of the gene family is called PCF, proliferating cell factor. It was isolated in rice. And what they were able to, so here's an alignment of uh, TB1 in the PCF proliferating cell factor. And um, so they have the same uh, basic helix loop helix motif in them. And what PCF was shown to do in rice was to directly regulate a cell cycle gene called PCNA and therefore drive positively the cell cycle. So this acts as a positive regulator of the cell cycle, and it's a member of the same gene family as TB1. The PCF was known to bind to a particular a motif. It's binding a domain or motif is GGNCCC. So um, this was shown by a, a, a Japanese group uh, headed by Ohashi. And um, so we wondered, well, does TB1 also bind to that same uh, binding site? And so we did, uh, postdoc in my lab, uh, uh, Y Wang, did the uh, random binding site assays. And this part of the gel's clipped off. But uh, he found that, uh, that uh, if he could get it to do the gel shift, and then he could sequence what it's binding to, and it was GG, preference for G here, but basically GG and CCC, exact same binding site. So TB1 and the proliferating cell factor both bind to the same uh, 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 binding site. And then he said, <clears throat> well, let's look at PCNA, the cell cycle gene, and see if it binds the promoter of that. So here's maize, uh, the promoter of the maize PCNA gene. 
and it has a TB1 binding site, and uh, this uh, gel shift assay shows that TB1 does bind to it, it shifts the band, and if you mutate the binding site, then the gel shift is, is lost. So we know then that, um, or, uh, that the TB1 also seems to regulate the cell cycle gene, and he did one thing further, he just confirmed it by chromatin immunoprecipitation to show that, um, that uh, the TB1 is binding to the, uh, the promoter region of the PCNA gene. So now we know that TB1 is all regulating the cell cycle gene the same as the proliferating cell factor does. The proliferating cell factor is a positive regulator of the cell cycle. Uh, what's TB1 doing? Well, TB1 is a repressor of branch outgrowth Repressor, so we think it should be a repressor of cell division and then uh, interfering with the activity of PCNA. So he, uh, these are uh, some tissue in situ hybridizations of very young maize plants. Um, so these would, this would be like the growing point of the plant. These are the uh, leaves coming off. And then this is where a branch would form. That's an axillary bud. And that's where TB1 is expressed in that axillary bud. What's it doing there? It's blocking these cells from dividing and therefore blocking the outgrowth of the branch. And so then how do you make, knowing that about the gene involved, how would you make a, a, a teosinte plant to a maize plant? Well, you've got to block the outgrowth of this axillary bud so you get these shorter axillary buds, and uh, shorter axillary branches. And so you might do that if TB1 is a repressor by uh, upregulating the TB1 gene in maize relative to teosinte in, in the axillary buds. And so we just asked that, you know, if you look at TB1 message levels associated with the teosinte allele and the maize allele, these are just replicates, teosinte allele, maize allele. This is in an isogenic background. This is an old northern blot. And you can see that the maize allele is expressed at a more high level than the uh, teosinte allele. So that seemed to fit then. So what, what was taking place during domestication, we think, is an upregulation of this gene uh, to cause repression of the axillary buds. And then if that's the case, then we might see that the maize and teosinte allele uh, for these axillary buds is going to give different levels of expression of the target, um, <clears throat> the target cell cycle gene, such as PCNA. And so when you have the maize allele, it's repressing the cell cycle. You've got less PCNA expression. When you've got the, TC, the te teosinte allele, um, so it should be less repressive of the cell cycle gene. And so you get more of the cell cycle gene um, expressed. And here's another cell cycle gene called prolifera. So what we think is happening then is that uh, PCF, is, as a member of this TCP family of transcriptional regulators, is a positive regulator of the cell cycle. And TB1 is interfering with the, you know, acting as a block or a competitor at that step uh, and is a negative regulator of the cell cycle. So if that's the case, so I'm suggesting there's a change in regulation, we thought, well, it should be um, how the, uh, the gene is expressed. And so there must have been a change in, in, in gene expression and gene regulation in maize relative to teosinte. So we wanted to do basically a QTL mapping experiment within a gene, within the TB1 gene, and see if we could find the particular part of the gene that was responsible for the difference between maize and teosinte. So this is just that, a, a car, cartoon of that genomic region. Here's the next gene upstream. It's 160 KB away from the teosinte branch gene, which is here. And most of that 160 KB is filled with retrotransposons, which are these little blue rectangles. You know, one of the things I have to say is to get this, it took two backs to go from here to there. You know, now we're getting a genome, something like a genome sequence from A's. But um, anyway, uh, it was a lot of work to, you know, to actually do all the genomic sequence there for us. And then we collected crossovers. It's just really good old-fashioned genetic mapping. If the green represents a teosinte chromosome, all this is an isogenic background, we collected a recombinant that would have maize chromosome all the way up to here, but it would have the teosinte coding region of TB1. Here's one that has all teosinte upstream, but has the maize coding region. Here's one that has teosinte at gene three and up this way, but it's maize down here. This one was through two rounds of recombination, and, and here's another one, here's another one. And then if you just look at the phenotypes associated with these different recombinants, so this uh, would be like whether it produces tillers or long branches or has certain ear phenotypes, and this is highly significantly different from the recurrent maize inbred parent. This one, this chromosome is 
statistically identical to the recurrent parent. In other words, if you have the teosinte coding region, it doesn't change phenotype at all. If you have the teosinte upstream region, it changes phenotype very significantly. Um, if you have gene 3 and what's up from there, there's no effect. If you have this bit, there's a big effect. And if you just put it all together, what it tells you is the thing that makes maize and teosinte different is between 60 and 70 KB upstream of the open reading frame. So my current grad student has been going back, and he's looking in more detail at that. And, he's, and this is actually about a year out of date, this slide, but it makes the point. He's taken that region and collected more recombinants in this region between 58 and uh, 69 KB upstream. These are a couple of the classes of the recombinants. You know, here he has a crossover right in the middle of that. <clears throat> and um, when he analyzes these, what we got was a surprising result for us, is that if you have maize, <clears throat> you have um, very few bran basal branches or tillers. If you have teosinte throughout the whole region, you have uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, basal branches or tillers. If you have just um, this half of the what we call the control region, you're somewhat intermediate. If you have just this half of the control region, you're somewhat intermediate. But again, if you have both parts of the control region, then you have lots of it. So basically, the answer what I'm trying to hear is that this is complex. There are two different parts here that are affecting gene regulation. It's not just one element, but there are multiple elements in that region. And, and what he's doing now is he's taking this region and doing uh, tra uh, transient expression assays to identify the specific uh, uh, regulatory elements in that region that control the expression of TB1. And so what we think, you know, going on is uh, something like this, where here's the TB1 open reading frame. Somehow the chromosome's looping around, and some factor is there. And this uh, is then uh, driving the um, uh, this enhancer here is driving the expression of TB1. So then, for our evolutionary model, the way you know I look at it is that what I haven't really explained this, but we what we think, um, and uh, actually uh, through the rest of the lecture you'll see some information in this regard, is that. TB1 in teosinte is involved in ear development. It's expressed in the ear, and it's involved in ear development, so it's going to be expressed in these regions. Um, but it's not really doing anything to repress axillary branch outgrowth. So you have this. You have um, long branches with tassels on the tips, and then the short, these branches under TB1 influence stay short and produce ears. Um, so it's, TB1 is off in the primary branch buds, but it's on in the secondary branches where the ears are formed. In maize, it comes on in these primary branches, so they stay short and form ears on the tips. And then if you knock the gene out, your branches get very long and get tassels on the tips, but you don't make an ear because you need TB1 to make an ear. So where you would normally get ear, you get these little tassely things. They're not really nicely formed tassels, but they are, they are tassels. <clears throat> so to summarize for TB1, it's a multi, their plant architecture, it's a multi- genic inheritance, but there's one large player, TB1s, and it's this type of transcription factor. Its function is to downregulate cell cycle genes, um, and the maize allele is more highly expressed. And now we know that that cis regulatory element has some, it's complicated. It's not just like one thing up there. <clears throat> now, another, uh, pl uh, one of the QTL we investigated is for ear phenotype. And here's a teosinte ear. I like to make it, uh, you know, it's actually homologous to a stick of bamboo. So it's actually, if you like the word homology that evolutionists use, uh, it's homologous. Like So that this would be the internodes, and this is a node, an internode, and a node. But each of the internodes is hollowed out to form a little cup. And inside that cup is a single kernel develops. This is the silk for the pollen tube to grow down and carry out fertilization. At maturity, these little uh, uh, units uh, become hard like little stones, and then it breaks apart for seed dispersal. And inside is a single mature seed. So that's the teosinte ear. And then all the stuff that forms the casing on the outside makes up the maize cob. And the kernels, which are on the inside here, then are on the outside. So we did QTL mapping for these, this phenotype. And we found multiple QTL. And I'm sure with more statistical power, we'd find more. But we always found this very big effect one on chromosome 4. Um, if you take that region of, oh, I want to go back and explain one other thing here. <clears throat> um, let me see if this is, yeah, this will do. Um, in this slide, if you look here, you can see just like a little dot right there. That's a pore, and it's right here too. There's a little pore there. 
when this, you know, the seed is inside there. You might think, well, how does that seed germinate and get out of there? Okay. So when the seed is in there and it germinates, the shoot grows up out of here. And out of that little pore there comes the root. So there's like a little pore there that the root comes out of, the primary root out of that little pore. So now what we did is we took the teosinte chunk of chromosome and we put it into um, maize. So this is a maize ear with like 10 generations of back crossing, but keeping that one little chunk of chromosome 4 from teosinte. And what it does in the maize ear, it makes like little teosinte fruit cases in the context of a maize ear. And it even remakes that little pore that the root is supposed to grow out. So this is like a master regulatory gene in my view, right? Just at this point, so we're thinking that's controlling fruit case or the casing development. Um, you know, but at this point, all we knew it was a chunk of chromosome. It could be a thousand genes all in that one chunk of chromosome. So that that was uh, we didn't know at this point, but I, we, it was remarkable the the ability of it to reproduce the teosinte developmental program in the context of a maze here. So this is where we mapped our QTL. We then uh, could show that we could get that QTL to mendelize, which enabled us to, by <clears throat> um, cleaning up the background, putting in an isogenic background, and behave like a single Mendelian gene. <clears throat> and so we could go ahead and clone it. Um, this is actually the reverse introgression. So this is a, a teosinte ear again. Uh, here again, the little pore the root grows out of. And this has the maize version, the maize bit of chromosome 4 put into it. So here's the teosinte fruit case. Uh, there's a little pore. If you stick in the maize version, the fruit case doesn't develop fully, and now the kernel becomes visible. So that's like really important if you want to use this as a crop, because you don't have to uh, work so hard to get the seed out of the casing. Now it'll be easily removed from the casing. So this must have been a very big step in maize domestication. And that's one chromosome segment uh, to go from here to there. So we cloned the gene, right? And so it didn't turn out to be 1,000 genes all closely linked together, or even 100, or even two. It turned out to be just one gene. It's a transcription factor, uh, teosinte gloom architecture. Uh, they're, it's a plant-specific group. And the, what they are known for is that they um, regulate Mads box genes. In fact, that's how this class of transcription factors was first identified, as regulators of Mads box genes. So we thought, well, maybe it's another story, like a change in gene expression, you know, a cis-regulatory change of some sort. And so we looked at whether the maize and teosinte alleles were expressed differently. And they're expressed in mature ear and not in a root or um, leaf or, or tassel or husk leaves, but they're expressed, or maybe a little bit in husk leaves, but they're expressed in the mature ear. And, uh, but the maize and teosinte accumulate about the same amount of transcript, which you can also show by real-time PCR. So it didn't look like an expression difference, but we did find that there was a single amino acid. So here's the, uh, the sequences from uh, 13 different types of maize and 14 different types of teosinte. And there are some other little polymorphisms here. They're hard to spot, but there's always an asparagine in maize at this position and always a lysine in teosinte, and all other grasses have a lysine there. So the asparagine is unique to maize, uh, rice and wheat and sorghum. They have homologs. They all have a lysine there. So a single change to an asparagine is what distinguishes maize and teosinte. So what does that asparagine do? Well, maybe it changes the binding specificity of this DNA binding transcription factor. So we said, well, let's compare uh, the maize and teosinte TGA proteins and see if they bind to different binding sites. So this is another binding site assay. The binding site that we could identify was GTAC. And the maize and teosinte proteins and then uh, recognize the same binding site. So the amino acid change did not change the binding site specificity. But we noticed something else different, that there was a large band on the gel, uh, which was predominant with maize, and a, large, a smaller one predominant in teosinte, although there's a little bit of large with teosinte, and there's a little bit of small with maize. And our thinking was that this was a monomer, and this was a, a, a dimer. And that, so there was a change that associated with that single amino acid change in the relative amounts of monomer and dimer of the protein. So uh, we tested that just by, actually by a couple different experiments, and I'll just show you one. So you could express the maize protein, and you see the monomer and the dimer, and then you can hook a tag onto the maize protein to make it a little bit larger, and then so it comes up, it shifts up in the gel, so here's the monomer, here's the dimer, and then you can co-express the two together. And you see you get this one, the monomer, small form, dimer, small form, monomer, big form, monomer, big form, and then there's the heterodimer. 
So um, that would, that's suggesting then that what this is is dimer formation uh, and that the single amino acid change affects the ability to form the dimer. And it's more common to form a dimer in maize and less likely in teosinte. But we don't think that is any, this, or we don't think that's really important. And what we think is, although I shouldn't say that so strongly, um, what we th think is going on is that there's a change in the way that the, that amino acid changes the way that it regulates the target genes. And this, this was a, um, a transient expression assay that Wai Wang did in the um, lab. And if you're a molecular biologist and you're familiar with this sort of experiment, this will be easy to comprehend. Um, if not, there will be a punchline in the end. So but I'll go through and explain it. So he makes these three different constructs. So here's the construct. It has what's called a Lexa uh, DNA binding domain and has a very strong activator called VP16. It's hooked up with a 35S promoter. So it makes a protein like this. And this protein then um, comes down with this Lex DNA binding domain, and it binds to this Lex DNA binding site. And that, with this strong activator domain, drives the production of firefly luciferase in maize cells, maize protoplast. Okay? So we have this construct, and we put it in, this, in the cells with this construct, and we can produce a lot of firefly luciferase. The other construct we make has a rice actin promoter, and it's hooked up to a bit of our TGA gene. And we do two experiments. In one of, the T, one of the experiments, we have a form of the gene that has the maize amino acid. In the other experiment, we have a form of the gene that has a teosinte amino acid. And then this is hooked up to a GAL4 DNA binding domain. So this is going to make a protein. And this protein is also going to bind to this construct, but it's going to bind to the GAL4 DNA binding site. And so it could either do nothing when it binds there, or it could interfere with the ability of this a protein to positively regulate this construct and make firefly luciferase. And then we can ask, does it make a difference once it binds here, whether you have the maize or the teosinte amino acid in this construct? And so now we get to the bottom line here. And so <clears throat> these are the results over here. So this is, um, if you have the maize amino acid, you'll notice that there you get in this construct, you get very little firefly luciferase produced relative to if you have the teosinte amino acid in the construct, in which you get much more. You get about the same as the positive control with you know, basically no competing thing binding here. And then this is a known repressor from Arabidopsis IAA, which is a negative control. And so what this is telling us is that single amino acid difference is taking the teosinte form of the protein and making it into a repressor. So now what we think it's doing, it's that the single amino acid change is repressing the target genes as opposed to maybe activating them. <clears throat> and so we wanted to see if that was true. So we did um, one of these expression chip uh, experiments where you just, you know, we uh, hybridized the maize and teosinte um, to an expression uh, chip, uh, maize and teosinte RNAs to an expression chip and identify uh, genes that are differentially regulated between... And, not surprisingly, we identified a lot of genes, but we identified a lot of Mads box genes in particular. And that's what expected because this class of proteins regulates Mads box genes. And what we found consistently with, or not consistently, but with uh, most of them, there were two exceptions, is that if you look at the level of expression when you have uh, the teosinte allele of the gene, it's higher. And when you have the maize version of the gene, it's lower. Teosinte higher, maize lower. And these, these are the names for some reason don't show up here, but these are different. Each pair of columns here represents a different MADS gene of maize. And so what's happening then is when you have the maize allele, the target genes are expressed at a, rel at a lower level, and uh, that was all confirmed by uh, chromatin Im immunoprecipitation. So then for this uh, fruit case story, it's multigenic inheritance. The TGA is large effect QTL. It's this class of transcription factor. Um, it's a single amino acid change that's causative. The, the class regulates Mads box genes. And either protein dimerization or change to switch to becoming a repressor of target genes is what seems to be um, the key event in, in uh, the change in uh, <clears throat> maize domestication. We think, like, you know, there's a series of target genes. Those Mads box genes are involved in regulating the formation of the fruitcase. If you repress them, then the fruitcase doesn't develop properly. 
So Wai Lang did one more experiment. So we didn't have a knockout mutant for TGA. So he did an RNAi knockout and, um, so not, uh, of, of the gene. And so here's a wild type maize cob. And that thing that forms the casing on the seed, you don't even see. It's very tiny and it's in, back in there underneath all this red chafe. But when you knock out the TGA gene by RNAi, that thing that's down in there becomes enlarged. It's no longer repressed by the maize allele. And you get this uh, white, it's called a gloom, uh, becomes enlarged. And so the TGA is um, uh, involved in repressing the gloom in maize, probably actively growing it in Teosinte. But anyway, so we saw this nice year phenotype, and so that was good to see that when we uh, knock out the gene by RNAi that we get a, a, a related phenotype. But he got something surprising, too. He saw a whole plant phenotype. So here's um, a sib that is not a, 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 was you know, in the same family as this, but does not carry the transgene, the RNAi construct. And here's one carrying the RNA construct. And the branch gets very long. So this is like, wow, this is like a TB1 phenotype with long branches, but it's not the same. It's all the axillary buds don't grow out. It's not like derepressing all the axillary buds. But the one that is derepressed, the one that's still there forming, it becomes much longer. And you can see here are two wild types. And then here are the ones with um, uh, the RNAi construct. The branches get very long. And they even form these little secondary ears, like Teosinte would, on the sides of the branches. And there are some kernel phenotypes as well. The kernels are smaller, and they're pointier, which would be more Teosinte-like as well. So we were surprised to see that our gene for the casing is having a whole plant phenotype as well. And so then we were kind of, he said, um, we we're kind of reminded that, um, that if you, uh, the, where the uh, TGA, which has the known um, effect on the ear, the formation of this gloom, TB1 is having uh, effect mostly on plant architecture, but it also affects the ear. And here's that same gloom. It's this uh, whitish organ. You can't see it in wild-type maize, but if you have wild-type maize and you just put in the teosinte allele of TB1, this um, uh, gloom becomes enlarged. That's the thing that's going to make the covering on the seed. So this is a plant architecture gene, but it also has a small effect on the formation of the covering on the seed. So it told us that these two genes are both affecting the same phenotypes, one affecting the ear more strongly, but plant architecture weakly, and the other one just the other way around. And the fact that TB1 affects ear development is not too surprising because we knew it was expressed in the ear. And in particular, you can see here it's expressed in the gloom. So it's going to repress the formation of the gloom to grow up and cover the seed in maize because you have higher expression. But in teosinte, it'll, this will then become enlarged and cover the seed. So it's, this is how the teosinte TB1 gene could affect the ear formation and the seed covering. So that gave us, well, these, maybe these two genes are really working together in the same pathway. So he looked and found that, in fact, in the promoter of TGA are two TB1 binding sites. So TB1 then, it seems, could regulate uh, TGA. And so he did the gel shift assays and found that in, indeed it does. It recognizes both binding sites. And if you mutate the binding site, then the gel shift is eliminated for both cases. So this would tell us that TB1 is involved in the regulation of TGA. And he confirmed that by uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation as well. So now I've told you up to here that you know, TB1 is regulating this cell cycle genes. And TGA is regulating all these different MADS genes. And so now what we know is TB1 is also regulating TGA. These two things work together in the same uh, pathway. And some other things are known now, too. Sarah Hake's lab has shown that there's a microRNA that regulates TGA. And uh, several labs have actually shown that phytochrome B, not directly, but in some way, is regulating TB1. And that uh, phytochrome B is responding to shade. And this tells us something what we think TB1 is doing. We think TB1 is involved in the shade response uh, in, in Teosinte. So that if you're heavily shaded, um, TB1 comes on and you grow up and you don't branch. But if you're out in the open, TB1 stays off and you branch profusely. And, so, and then we have one other gene that we've cloned in our lab, which I'm not going to talk about. We call it NOT1. And um, it's also in the same pathway. And as you can see why I'm jealous of the Arabidopsis people, because they, they, they could download all this information from the web somewhere, right, uh, based on the hundreds of people working on Arabidopsis. But most of this stuff is just worked out by us, by 
uh, in, our own, uh, in our own lab. And we can get little snippets from other labs occasionally, but it makes it very hard. So anyway, so that was the surprise, that these two genes were working together in the same pathway. So then, uh, you know, we asked, well, we know that these genes were involved in maize domestication. Were they the targets of selection? <clears throat> and if you think about domestication, things go through a bottleneck. So if the different colors represent different alleles at a gene, you have lots of alleles in teosinte, and then you get a reduction just by the bottleneck effect alone to a fewer number of alleles in maize. And you, usually maize retains only about 50 to 70 percent of the teosinte diversity. But if you add selection to the bottleneck, then you go from lots of alleles down to one or maybe one or two, and maize will drop to like 25% of the diversity. So we did a variety of different statistical tests of the genes um, in the pathway. So we said, well, what, are, what about the genes in the pathway? Where are they targets of selection? And by and large, they are. So we can find very strong evidence for selection at multiple, uh, uh, at four of the six MADS genes and at all three of these key regulators. So that this would tell us not only was, is this regulating the uh, development uh, both of ear and plant architecture, but that it was, appears to be under selection during maize domestication. And so I'll just end there and summarize. So uh, you know, maize was domesticated from teosinte. Um, there was this profound morphological um, transition. We know now two of the key players um, involved in this. Um, they're members of the same regulatory network or pathway, whatever you'd like to call it. It was a target of selection. And, uh, you know, I guess for me, the thought is, you know, this has taken us a long time, right? So we've been uh, picking away at this for 20 years. So we did our first QTL mapping experiments. Maybe we started those in uh, 1989, and this is where we are now. And I think for the first part of it, like the QTL mapping is now going to be really, or positional cloning is going to be a piece of cake for us now. So we'll be able to positionally clone things in corn relatively easily. That, and in 1989, it was unknown that you could clone genes, really. I mean, developmental genes where you've yet to been cloned. So now we can say the cloning part will be quite easy. But for me, what's uh, the challenge, and you know, smart people should think about and solve, is how to do all the biochemistry in some sort of, and maybe you people know how to do it, but I don't, you know, like all the you know, high throughput <coughs> biochemistry to really figure out the functional differences between these contrasting alleles that come from the different, uh, from the crop versus the wild ancestor. Because it's nice enough to know that this is the gene and that they have this nucleotide difference, but to actually show what that nucleotide difference does and to do it for not just two genes, but to do it for 100 genes in corn and I think that to me is the, the challenge going forward. So, okay, well, I'll stop and thanks for listening. <laughs> flies when you have a good seminar. So it's a little bit after one. If any students have, need to head off to class, they can. Otherwise, I'm sure John would be pleased to take questions. I have one. So with the arginine to lysine mutation, what have, have people looked at what happens if you did the equivalent mutation in rice or one of the other? Yeah, what would happen if you did that in rice? And um, I don't know. I, I learned this morning that we might be able to get the rice knockout of that gene because we know what the... Uh, we know what the gene is in rice, and um, but no one has done that uh, experiment in rice. And you know, maybe it's unlikely that it will uh, control exactly the same thing in rice. It probably will control some aspect of inflorescence development, but rice inflorescence is so different from the teosinte inflorescence. I think it's unlikely. There's a a colleague uh, who sort of roped me into writing a a little funny piece for Nature Biotechnology where we said we could take these genes and put them into wheat and have wheat and barley on the cob. Uh, and not that I would, I have no idea why you'd want to do that. But uh, anyway, uh, so maybe you'd be, you could try something like this and, and see what it would do to rice. But my guess is it might just make some sort of defect in, in fluorescence development. Yes? Uh, how does a double mutant CBT gene look like? Yeah, um, so if you combine the, um, if you, and we've done this, so it takes the teosinte allele of TB1 and combine it with the teosinte allele of, uh, uh, of, of TGA in a purely maize background, right? So it, does, it makes it more extreme. So the ear becomes even smaller and much harder. It's still a maize ear, but instead of looking, it just looks like this really hard uh, conglomeration of little 
uh, fruit cases. And then the, the plant actually becomes like much less robust, so the stem is not as thick. It's more grassy looking and stuff like that. So it, it, there's, I don't know that it's, I would say it's synergistic, but it's at least you know, nicely additive and does move it further along to looking, even though it's like most all maize otherwise moves it much further along to looking like teosinte. It's quite extreme. We showed uh, five or six major contributors to domestication genetically. Um, so is there much known about, um, in the domestication process, uh, what order those were selected? And, and are there any extant uh, land races that have one or two or three, but not all? Yeah, so um, no, we don't know the order. Um, there, the only way I can really think of getting in, I'm not sure there would be the power uh, with maize, but would be through some sort of population genetic approach. You know, where the, the you can kind of there's methods for using population genetics to date the most recent common ancestor of two alleles, and you could do that, and you could see you could make. But I don't know that we really have the power to do it. And um, for these ones, for these two genes, we've uh, surveyed diverse maize, and they're all the same. So that those two were fixed probably very early on in the domestication process. But I. I think you know for some of the smaller players, like these are really two of the big players, um, and you know I th for some of the smaller players, which would be many, many more, I think you'd find that yes, there are modern maize varieties that look like maize to us, but have a gene that's uh, more representative to synthe compared to most maize. Yeah. 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 So related question, I guess. Um, so it, it's kind of easy to see why in the process of domestication and selection you select for a big ear with lots of big seeds on it. It's, it's not so clear to me why you'd select for the different architecture. And do you, it, is it your sense that in the, in the domestication of maize, um, did the architecture just go along for the ride and it's all about selection on the cob? Or yeah, no, it's um, so it, that's a classic change in domestication is to have a change in plant architecture to have fewer branches and um, so a smaller number of larger inflorescences. And you know the way uh, you can think about it, if you if you when you change plant architecture, what you're changing is you have, in Teosinte you've got hundreds of little ears all over the plant. You're getting rid of all those side branches because you're just going to produce one side branch with one big giant ear. So if you're if you're going to walk through a field of corn or teosinte and do the harvest, would you rather stop at each plant and pull off 100 ears, or would you rather stop at each plant and pull off just one big ear? Well, yeah, okay. Big ears. What? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, you know, so what actually is probably going, of course, 100 big ears would be great, but actually they're, pro they're not probably changing yield at all. They're just uh, changing, improving harvestability. That if you grew t corn and teosinte together under similar environmental circum under uh, environmental circumstances appropriate to teosinte, teosinte would produce as much grain, uh, you know, in terms of grams per plant as corn grown under the same environment. And so, uh, yield um, is not maybe what they were selecting for. They were selecting for harvestability. So the plain change in plant architecture had to do with that. Yeah. One yeah. more, and then we need to move uh, uh, John along to the next point. Chuck. Oh, I just. It's a little bit off topic, but I just want to, could you synopsize and maybe make a comment about what's known about the biology of flowering time in maize and domestication? Um, so, the, so probably that wasn't altered flowering time. So that because There's corn... So, you know, nothing, okay, so nothing is known of what happened went, went way back then, but we know corn and teosinte uh, are both, you know, where corn first arose, they're both adapted to the same day-length regime. And so they should have flowered at about the same time. And so I don't think there was a, and if you go down there now, you'll certainly find corn and teosinte. You know, they're going to. Yeah, I, I guess I mean also the duration of flowering, not just the time. <coughs> because presumably corn produces, just goes for this one. That's day, right, yeah. Cycle <coughs> that's right. And and yeah. So that's true. So what will happen I is. That's what I was really interested Okay, in. yeah. So on an individual plant, like a, a, a nice healthy corn plant in my field will produce good pollen for five days or something like that. A nice healthy teosinte plant will produce pollen for several weeks because the first the top tassel produces pollen and then this one, then this one, and then this one. So it continues to produce lots of pollen for weeks. So you know. 
Uh, no, so corn, the single corn tassel would produce much more pollen than any single teosinte tassel. I mean, is it pollen? <clears throat> Um, so the receptivity of the silks are going to do the same. So they're, yeah. So it's just like it it collapsed the time interval all down to like you know a week, if that's. And that's through the architecture. It's through architecture, yeah. Okay, please uh, join me again in thanking John. <laughs>